Okay, so next speaker is Zayla Zanolli, talking about Spintronics at Interface. Mm -hmm. Okay, this works. It's a first. So thanks for the invitation, thanks for the prize, and this is uh, uh, the work that I've uh, that have been awarded. So it's a long uh, work, uh, started uh, about five years ago when I was in Yiddish with the Marie Curie grant that I continued in, uh, in Haken uh, with fundings from the, the DFG. So um, it's about speedronics and the interface. Uh, so we want to use first principle techniques to investigate the details uh, um, at the microscopic level of uh, interfaces which are useful for Spintronics application. Of course, uh, reasons for uh, uh, studying Spintronics, there are plenty. Uh, the basic idea is that we want to use uh, the spin degree of freedom of the electron uh, in order to make devices. And the advantages are multiple, but uh, first of all, uh, the magnetic energy scale is uh, much smaller, like order of magnitude, one order of magnitude smaller than electronic process. So we can make uh, low power devices exploiting uh, spin properties, and also uh, magnetic properties are enhanced at the nanoscale, so we can have device miniaturization. Of course, uh, if you are studying fundamental physical property, this also has, uh, like opens the door uh, to uh, investigation of basic physical property, but also you can have nice applications. So we have it all, then we do it. So the, the first thing is, if you want to make devices, uh, you have to have uh, like a transistor. And the idea is not new, it dates back from the 90s uh, by the data uh, spin transistor. And the main ingredient here is that to use uh, a channel material, um, uh, which is uh, uh, where you have like spin polarized carrier and you want to manipulate them. You want to act on them with an external potential, uh, some gate potential. And data show that it's possible to do this and the possibility of acting on the spins that are here in the channel is proportional to the spin orbit coupling of the channel material. So for this, uh, everybody can immediately say, okay, so to make this work, we need a material with strong spin orbit coupling and very long spin diffusion length in order to, I mean, you want that the electron, they travel the distance they reach the other end of the device. Seems easy in theory. In practice, it's not because uh, it's very rare, uh, it's, it's like usually these two properties are competitive, so it's very difficult to find a material with both uh, strong spin orbit coupling and long spin diffusion length. Typical example like in uh, semiconductors or carbon-based nanomaterials, you have the opposite behavior. And that's where uh, uh, first principle approach comes and help us because we can use uh, uh, first principle to design new materials, and in particular, we want to design interfaces and try to use this uh, to combine different material to get different, let's say, taste, flavors. You can change, uh, uh, you can tailor the properties by design and then you can try the, what are the best combination which have the better taste if you want. And then, uh, uh, but what is most important uh, with DFT is that you can really study what happens at the microscopic level locally at the interface. It's not just you know, macroscopic properties and with this talk we will use these tools to investigate um, the details of the interaction, which uh, uh, materials uh, is responsible for which properties, and we will see, and this I have to thank Stefan, that we are going to see some of the properties that he has presented about the like, topological insulator, Jalowski uh, Moria interaction, and so on. We will find them in our interaction. So, um, which materials? So the first point is you have to choose your candidate materials to, to do the work. And uh, we start with carbon, uh, which is, has the big advantage of having a very long spin diffusion length. This is intrinsic in carbon. It's because the atomic number is small, like six. And so you can have that. Um, but the problem is uh, carbon is not magnetic. And if you take a perfect carbon nanotube or a perfect graphene sheet, uh, there are, let's say, uh, there is no magnetism in that. So you have to do something. You have to functionalize uh, the, the system somehow. So one possibility is to create uh, vacancies. You have defects when you have unsaturated bonds. The electron there will, will carry some uh, magnetic moment, and this 
you, you will have like some spin polarization which is not uh, negligible. Or you can put like a nanocluster of a magnetic moment on graphene or on nanotube, and this again will, uh, will uh, it's a way to induce magnetization in the otherwise non-magnetic things. And then you can think, okay, once we have this, we can think about having uh, like a nanoelectronics based on carbon to have this spin transport. So uh, it's a good candidate, but you have to you cannot just take it as it is, you have to work on it. And graphene spin transistor, they have been uh, obtained, achieved in the lab, but there are still some, uh, let's say, fun some fundamental issues which are related to the weak spin orbit coupling and to the zero gap of the graphene. So, uh, as we said, in order to have a working spin transistor, you need to have a high spin orbit coupling to be able to manipulate the spin, and here we fail. And the other point is, uh, if there is no gap, you cannot switch your transistor off. And so it's a quite kind of a problem. So how do we solve this? Um, uh, we make an interface. We make an interface uh, uh, between graphene. We, we place graphene on a substrate. Um, if this substrate is magnetic uh, and uh, semiconducting, it will induce some magnetism in the graphene, but this it has to be shown, so it's not obvious. And uh, uh, if we want the material, the, the substrate material with high spin orbit coupling, the hybrid material will also inherit that. And in addition, is either we can apply an external field or we use a ferroelectric in order to tune the bands. And so that's the idea of putting graphene on top of a magnetoelectric substrate. So uh, in practice, how do we do it? So as I said, uh, I'm using first principle techniques. And for these uh, works in particular, two codes have been used, Siesta and Fleur. Um, for different targets, uh, either for uh, to deal with large system or uh, to check on the accuracy and so on. Um, but in general, the combination of the, these two uh, codes give us uh, very detailed and accurate information on electronic strata, magnetic properties, and so on that we, we can use uh, to uh, study the details of the interaction. And then also combine to other codes like the Vanier 90 to get topological properties or with like a code by FIVOS to get spin dynamics. So we started easy from collinear spin calculation. Um, we said our choice uh, as is for the substrate is, uh, um, a barium, is barium manganese oxide. Uh, we want something with manganese because it has T electrons. It binds pretty well with the graphene, so it's a practical choice. It's hexagonal, so you can put it on graphene. And uh, um, most important is semiconducting, so we will not sh so short circuit your graphene because then when you go and talk with your experimentalist friends uh, and you say, ah, I'm going to do an interface, the first question is, is the substrate insulating or uh, a metal? Because otherwise, if it's a metal, all the electrons, they go through the substrate and you can't do much. So here, uh, um, it's antiferromagnetic uh, in the, between the layers. So uh, let's say the, the yellow atoms that you don't see here are in the middle of this, um, uh, let's say, red um, things. So these are the manganese and they are antiferromagnetic in, let's say, in the C direction here, and in plane they will form some triangular uh, lattice. We will see more uh, later with spin orbit uh, uh, coupling calculation about that. So first, uh, we do a slab, just uh, uh, to check that actually, I mean, the system stays uh, semiconducting, and it is. Uh, we have, uh, it's spin polarized, uh, so that's, you can see it also in the bands, uh, red and black are the two spin polarization. And what is interesting to see is that at the top uh, of the slab, at the two, let's say, uh, edges of the slab, you have extra charge. So you have basically two more electrons per manganese atom, and this gives some extra magnetic moment with respect to the bulk. And this is also useful because it means the system, it's, it's ready to like donate electrons to make some binding uh, towards something. In this case, uh, it will be binding to the graphene. So uh, this is how the system looks like. Uh, there are several possible uh, configurations, but after some 
careful uh, study, one can see that, uh, let's say, that the lowest energy one is where the manganese, uh, they tend to be in the holocytes here. And uh, uh, the, the, the uh, binding is very strong. It's very, it's covenant. Sorry, I skipped one. Okay, up. So um, once we have this structure, we can calculate the electronic structure and uh, uh, it's been polarized as we want to. And uh, one can also uh, think about to use this to make spin polarized transport. So around uh, uh, the region here, close to the Fermi energy, so there is uh, the first interesting thing because one uh, spin channel uh, is conducting, the other is not. So there is a gap for one and no gap for the other. So you can use this as a spin filter. Uh, overall, uh, all the bands that are here, let's say, uh, not so far from the Fermi level, they are contributed by the interface atom only. So uh, these are already just properties of the interface. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, the graphene, but the manganese at the surface, the oxygen near to the manganese, and all the rest more, uh, uh, the inner ones, they do not contribute. In particular, barium does not contribute at all. Uh, because uh, it's like five S electrons are very low in energy, so um, any other rare art manganese oxide uh, will, will do the job because what is in front of here is the interface uh, with the manganese. So uh, last but not least, the high mobility region. Of course, we love graphene because of the high mobility region, the Dirac points. And uh, here uh, we notice that they are split by spin, and the splitting is quite large, about 300 uh, milli electron volt. And eventually one can use doping uh, to access this region. So uh, this is what we've just seen. If you dope, for instance, with boron, with an acceptor, you can raise it up, and if you put more, you can raise it up uh, a bit more so you can, uh, in experiment, access this uh, region here. Uh, also, um, with doping, uh, the velocity of the career improves, so you can, uh, you can also, I mean, there, there is an extra bonus uh, with, uh, for the mobility here. So now, uh, it's quite clear what happens from the electronic point of view. Um, there is some charge that goes from the manganese atoms uh, into the, 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 the graphene, and this is reflected in the magnetic properties of the system. Uh, so here I have uh, uh, the spin density, so spin up minus spin down uh, for our system, so graphene with the substrate from the side and from the top. And the uh, first thing one can notice is uh, the uh, magnetic moment on the manganese atoms, uh, they change after uh, the graphene is placed on the substrate. And that's because the electron, they jump into the graphene and uh, uh, induce magnetization in the graphene. So uh, it's important to notice the graphene is not strained, there are no defects, so the only reason to have a magnetic moment which is not zero in the graphene is because of the proximity uh, with the substrate. So magnetization is induced by the manganese. Um, but also, the story does not end here. This is already very nice and uh, was published uh, in uh, like uh, one year and a half ago. Uh, but then, uh, uh, so we decided, I decided, honestly, because I'm curious and I wanted to see, to go a bit further in this story. It's not just when you have an interaction, it's never just one that interacts on the other, but you can also have the other way around. So the graphene affects uh, the manganese, and you can already see it here because the magnetic moment goes, instead of being four, is about three at the top. So something is happening also from the other point of view. So what is graphene doing to the substrate? And that's the question that I want to answer here. For this, we perform the calculation with spin orbit coupling, with siesta and fleur, and uh, we found a remarkably nice agreement between the two codes. And uh, we recover, of course, for the bulk what is known in experiment. So this is calculated. Uh, so these are not the arrows that we put by hand. They are really uh, the result of the calculation. So you can really see the antiferromagnetic uh, alignment uh, on the manganese between plane and the, the uh, triangular arrangement of the spin in plane. Uh, we have uh, uh, the lossky mori interaction, as uh, Stefan uh, um, show before, and you, you can have, you have actually spin spirals here uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the plane. Uh, as you can see, the easy axis is basically an easy plane and is uh, uh, in plane here. 
So what happened now when we cut uh, the slab? So for a barium manganese oxide slab, um, uh, we basically recover the bulk properties, so still in plane EC axis, but when we put the graphene on top of it, things change uh, dramatically because uh, the, the easy axis of the system becomes, uh, let's say, in the Z direction instead of being in plane. And uh, uh, a reason for this is can be seen ex uh, in the interaction between the graphene and the manganese atom. So we saw that there were these electrons on the, like two per manganese atom. We saw that there is charge transfer and spin also transfer, and in a sense, uh, let's say the graphene here is like spinning, I mean, it takes the spin uh, of, uh, of the manganese and let's say encourage them to, to change, to be out of plane. And this is exactly due to the, uh, let's say, uh, inter close interaction between the two. So this is quite a strong effect. Um, now, uh, this is good, but uh, again, we wanted more, so we took the, we calculated the bands for spin orbit coupling. These are what we have seen before. We focus on the Dirac cones. So this is collinear, and oops, sorry. And this is with spin orbit coupling. So uh, we have spin orbit uh, splitting. So as Stefan said, you, you, we, here we are breaking the inversion symmetry of the graphene. And so uh, there is uh, some gaps that, that are opening here um, and at the K point. At the K point is about eight millieletron volt and right and left is about two. Uh, you see, okay, this is small. But if you think about, uh, uh, let's say, pristine graphene and you, you break uh, uh, and you apply a field and so on and you have the spin orbit splitting, these are like 200 order of magnitudes larger than one what you have in, in graphene. So it's a way, um, like a practical way to, to affect heavily the properties. So this hybrid system has uh, relevant spin orbit splitting. So this was done with Siesta, and then we, did, uh, we, we studied the interface, the bands, with FLIR as well, and we got the same result. Basically, we have a, uh, here is just the bands at the, at the interface. So we, get, uh, we got again a gap about 10 millieletron volt at the K point. Uh, the small gaps uh, right and left are about two, three uh, millieletron volts, so order of magnitudes are similar. And, uh, um, and then we used uh, um, the Vanier 90 to calculate all the topological properties. So uh, here is the anomalous hole conductivity, and one can see that is quantized. Um, so you have in correspondence to the energy of this uh, gap at K, the, it tops at one. And so we have, uh, uh, we have, we have calculated a certain number, which is one. So this, I all thank the introduction of uh, Stefan, because it's basically uh, all the fundamental things I explained before. And this system uh, is a, a, very, uh, a very nice system where we can uh, actually see um, this effect. And this also very curvature computed. So where you can see that at the K point, uh, you have, uh, you, you nicely have uh, the effect. So the system has uh, topologically non-trivial properties. And uh, now, I mean, that we have learned a lot of things with the spin orbit calculation, we wanted to go uh, again a bit further and see uh, the spin dynamics at finite temperature. And this is the last part of, uh, of the work. So, um, ah, shit, this does not work. So, uh, in order to study this, uh, we took our slab system and uh, uh, we wanted to, to so to, um, we, we, we did different spin configuration. We extracted the, the exchange coupling parameters between the planes and in plane like this and we put them in a Monte Carlo code and we got uh, uh, the spin dynamics. So this is how it looks like in general. Uh, and for instance, uh, uh, we did it with bulk first. So this is an example of a configuration that one can choose. And uh, we calculate the J with CS time FLIR, and the, the agreement between the two is really impressive. Uh, so we use the same configuration, uh, total energy calculation for the bulk, and we get basically uh, the same, uh, the same uh, strength for the interaction. 
main message here, okay, it's anti-ferromagnetic coupling in between the planes, which we all agree, and it's anti-ferro in plane. So these calculations are assuming collinear spins, so it's frustrated the system, so you cannot get anything better than that. But uh, the point is uh, we test also in this way siesta uh, against FLIR, and of course with this we can go with the larger system. And that's what we get for the larger system. So the full uh, slab without the graphene and with the graphene. So um, in any case, uh, the antiferromagnetic coupling between the layers is uh, preserved. Um, but what happens here? So actually, because uh, uh, of the, this extra charge at the top of the manganese atoms, you have that the spin uh, starts to be not completely in plane, but it has a component out of plane. But still, uh, I mean, most of it is, let's say, you have a projection in plane, which is not negligible. But when you put the graphene on top, the spin, they all go, let's say, out of plane, and basically what you have in plane is negligible. So this is, helps, let's say, is coherent also uh, with the picture that we got from spin orbit coupling calculation. Um, so what do we have here? That the, the putting the graphene on top of this surface uh, has a very strong effect, also in the mag magnetic direction, if with two different, let's say, approaches. Um, overall, uh, other comment that one can see here is that we have a magnetic softening of uh, all, the, all the J parameters. And another uh, important information is that the graphene also uh, affect not just the first layer at the inter, but also the, the penultimate layer uh, of, the, of the back material. So you have to go like two layers down from the interface. What happens here? There is a change in sign in the J parameters, uh, so it goes from antiferro to ferromagnetic coupling. So qualitatively, the, the concept is uh, if you want to model the interface, you should not stop at the first layer just below the interface. You have to go and see what happens a bit further because uh, the interaction is so strong that it also influences like uh, one or two layers below. Um, with this, uh, I will uh, basically summarize what we have seen. Uh, what we have seen in this talk. So um, we, have, we are using, uh, we are designing an interface between graphing and the uh, multiferrous material to announce, let's say, uh, the, the magnetic properties of graphene. And actually, we found the substrate influence these magnetic properties. So we have charge and spin transfer into the graphene, and you can tune it with the doping or applied field, as you like, but also that the graphene influence the substrate, and we have uh, a change in the easy axis of the substrate. Uh, we have a magnetic softening of the substrate. We have that interaction goes down a couple of layers below, below the interface. We have uh, spin, uh, spin orbit uh, splittings uh, and uh, topological uh, insulating non-trivial properties and so on and so forth. So it's a very rich uh, system, which very rich physics that you can like, try to explore by changing the ingredients, for instance different kind of substrate, uh, like different kind of, uh, let's say, monolayer material and so on, and they go and calculate actually the transport properties for these systems, because you can see from the band it's going to be interesting. So with this, uh, I thank uh, the collaborators. Uh, so uh, there is a large, uh, all the, let's say, the FLIR part of the work is done uh, in, in Ulich. He was uh, with the, the Monte Carlo code and Matthew also for the Eisenberg and so on. So and everybody is, you know, discussing and I'm backing everybody to, to give, you know, their work done. And I did all the siesta part uh, of this. So, and also funding uh, European and German and computing time. Before I go, I have an announcement. Please come to Milan. Uh, we are organizing the uh, European Theoretical Spectroscopy Conference. It's going to be uh, many body theories, some connection with chemistry, data science, and so on. We have uh, a list of, of invited speakers that are mostly here. Uh, so you are all welcome in Milan in uh, September to participate to our, uh, let's say, biannual event on uh, theoretical spectroscopy. And with this, I thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs>